Let me be a little bit um, silly with this kind of <laughs> question, but you guys sound a bit like neo-expressivists, you know? It's all about the process, you know, how I feel. I mean, are you guys the Peter Elbow of, of like, punk composition studies here? I mean, like, what, how would you characterize this shift, considering the ambivalence that our field has had toward exp expressivism? Where, how do you reconcile that ambivalence with that new media turn toward engagement, immersion, and a kind of process as the new hermeneutics of, of knowledge? Well, we all recognize that uh, feelings, feeling, <laughs> nothing more than, yeah, feelings and, and uh, other other rhetorical venues that are disrespectful to the institution never go away. You just hide them or mask them, and there's there's no rational that's not also hand in hand with the emotion. We've seen a huge amount of work in a variety of fields that is demonstrating this. Rhetoric has always said this, but now the neurosciences are saying it, and moral psychology is saying, it, and sociology says it. Political science is getting in on it. Even, even economists are starting to consider the possibility that we're not rational economic people making yeah. rational decisions. So uh, perhaps it's uh, more forms of uh, more a uh, ways of building on forms of knowledge that are really right there for us and wanting yeah. Yeah. return of the repressed. It's what we say we're not doing, and then others will come and tell us what it is we're doing. I, yeah. I, I'm just not, I don't worry about it so much. So, by the way, part of that question that I, that kind of moment of provocation with, like, Peter Elbow and whatever, I can edit that out if that's stupid, you know. If, you know just gonna, yeah, we like it. Yeah. Okay, cool. I couldn't. I didn't know if that sounded good after all. It just sounded good in my head before I said it, but, you know. Well, I think one of the reasons Greg, Greg Ulmer's work is so important is because that's sort of what a my story does, right? It engages forms of digital literacy, and it puts you know, who you are back into whatever it is that research and the making of knowledge is. Yeah. No, I just, you know, I mean, we both study with Victor Thomas, and there was definitely, like, he was concerned about that third rail of expressivism, like, being kind of painted with that brush back in the 90s. Yeah. Um, and, you know, yeah, I, I don't think that's as exigent a concern now, but it's interesting to note how you guys have said in so many um, eloquent ways, I mean, new media culture, the, the direction in which we're going now is toward ambience, emotion, pathos, all the kinds of things that the West has always characterized as bad or uh, irrelevant or irrational. Problematic. <laughs> you know? well, I, I think one of the things that I'm really excited about, and uh, you, you said the direction that we're going, and I think what I find so interesting is that we're now in a place where multiplicity and directions not trajectory, but trajectories. Yeah. And the multiplication of differences and those slight gradations where you have multiple multiplicities and all these different things coexisting where we can where we can represent multiple lines of flight happening simultaneously. Um, you know, uh, we keep going back to sensors and adding these different technical, electronic sensors that collect data for us. One of the things that that does is it allows us to collect multiple streams of information. And I think that's what's exciting. One of the things that got me into this uh, field was I was really excited about the historiography that was becoming possible through technology. So this goes way back. This goes back to what I was driven to with my dissertation and trying to see how historiography was being multiplied in the way that the, that these hugely complex stories, like the history of the Holocaust, being told by 50,000 survivors, who, according to Leotard's uh, different, exist, 
that's the that's the line of the denial, right? Yeah. yeah. So how do you tell history from fifty thousand simultaneous perspectives, any one of which may have an unimportant inaccuracy, but that inaccuracy is anathema to traditional historiography. Mm -hmm. And so when you say the direction that rhetoric, that composition is headed, I'm more excited about the possibilities of all of our directions and the ways in which, you know, I, people are talking about the problems of composition being fragmented. I, that is an exciting thing for me, that we can sustain all these different inquiries and all these different lines, so that ambient, theoretical, pedagogical, feminist, disability, technological, and they weave together and they inform each other in really interesting multiple forms. I'm glad you mentioned uh, um, feminism, because feminist, feminist theory has been making the argument that we need a richer conception of the human for decades. And now we can see how these arguments uh, resonate with, dovetail with other other things that are emerging. And so, you know, there's synergy. Yeah, yeah. Well, if I can, if I can use it as a segue, um, Mike, you talked about all these new trajectories and directions. Um, that was a really, I really enjoyed that description. I, you know, it's interesting because I do, I, I have heard as somebody goes to seas, like, oh, you know, seas, what is it now? There's so many things. And, you know, how do we kind of? And I really like that you found a way to kind of flip that, the flip the script on that negative description of change into a real positive way. That just that's that's really great. I appreciate that. Um, but anyway, related to the idea of directions and trajectories as a multiplicity, where are you guys going now in your work? Like, what what kinds of work are you doing right now? Want me to do that first? Go ahead. Um, I'm trying to write a prehistory of rhetoric, where I go back to uh, figures who have not been accepted or thought about as being integral to the development of rhetoric and trying to argue that they are, uh, including the pre-Socratics, and going back even further. I may even do uh, some stuff on uh, Paleolithic Kmart which is, uh, in my mind, the first multimedia environment. I think Leroy Goran would agree with you. Yeah. So what, what do you hope would be the implications of that kind of, of, that kind of work? I mean, to, to broaden out a history of rhetoric in that way, what would that do for the field? Well, it's, it also um, brings in uh, 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 potentials, forms of knowledge, forms of engagement that we tend to either not deal with in the field, or if we deal with them, it's always sort of like a, a rhetoric of X. But what if they're already part of who we are and what we do, and what would, how would that change our field's stories about itself? Yeah. Uh, there's, for the pre-Socratics, you have an engagement with the divine, with revelation, and with healing that goes part and partial with their quote-unquote philosophical explanations. Philosophy, of course, only takes that one little part, but they're far richer. And even Aristotle grants that uh, pre-Socratics were important to the development of rhetoric. Aristotle says, say, Empedocles developed rhetoric. Mm. So I want to start teasing this stuff out and uh, see what happens. And Mike? Well, I think you hear why Thomas gets things done. He's got one project, and he's totally invested in it. He's working on it. I've got a bunch of things going on. The most directly related to the sound work is uh, I've got an essay that I'm working on, The Clash, right now. But seeing the band The Clash in global context. So there's a, a brand new documentary that's out that's about rock and roll in Cambodia. And the Khmer Rouge murdered an entire, uh, well, they, that, it's Frank Sinatra. They, there was a Cambodian Frank Sinatra. And any visible rock and roller in Cambodia was killed. And so folks who are telling the story of this time in Cambodia's history are telling it from 
the perspective of survivor guilt and how I wasn't a backup singer, I'm a laundress, uh, was at the core of survival. So, you know, I'm talking about rebellion. This is, this is an interesting interesting moment. So I'm looking at that, at rock and roll in Cambodia, punk in, in uh, Korea, uh, uh, and why the uh, Indian subcontinent seems to not be producing. There's an indigenous uh, 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 music culture, and so they're not producing the same kind of visible uh, uh, musics. Um, so I'm very interested in that. I'm also working on a project about sound and healing. Um, ah. <laughs> that's along the lines of what Thomas is talking about. Uh, experience some loss, and uh, one of the ways that, that my wife and I dealt with that was going to a lot of live music shows. Mm. And so it became really interesting. Like at an old 97 show, realizing that the bass is moving my body and I can feel it and my heart is syncing up with that beat and to think about how how that changes your your interaction and, and the creating of that mass experience yeah. in that space. Um, and then in my in my professional and technical writing side, I'm also exploring with Liza Potts uh, uh, some work on uh, experience architecture, but those those themes were there in nascent form when we're talking about drum sets in stone basements and how that ambient uh, uh, rock and roll sound is produced by what you're uh, what you're surrounded by. So part of my problem is I've got all these different things trying to get get done simultaneously. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you guys for a really fascinating interview. Really appreciate it. We thank you for uh, rolling it around so quickly and doing it so well.